Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. Everything we once thought ourselves to be has been radically changed. For Christ's love compels us because we are convicted that one died for all and therefore all died. It is that love that challenges us to see past the ordinary, the uninspired, the watered down that blinds us to what's truly going on behind the scenes. It's that love that grows inside of us, deepening the very core of who we are. It pushes us to a new level that we are incapable of achieving on our own. So start running and never quit. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race we're in. Study how he did it, because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way. Cross, shame, death. And now he's there, in that place of honor, right alongside God. This is a race we're all capable of running. All we need to do is keep our eyes on Christ. But hold fast, because once it starts, it changes everything. Sabbath. It, it, it is good to be uh, on Friday evening together. You see, uh, when I look when I look here, I see a group of people which uh, I used to belong. Every single uh, break there was a new book college. I was the one who always stayed, and uh, <laughs> that, there was a few reasons for that. One of the reasons was very simply: I had a five part-time jobs. I used to work 62 hours a week plus my full-time studies. So if I wanted to take a holiday, I had to find somebody to replace me on my job, actually five jobs, and that was, that was a little bit hard. And so I decided all, all short breaks, which are not longer uh, than two weeks, I will just stay and work. And of course, you know, question of money, traveling back home was never easy. I was uh, studying in England uh, at Newport College, and, uh, and my family lived in Serbia, uh, Central Europe somewhere close to, you know, you know, Italy, you know, a little bit further up. This evening, I want to share a message under a very simple title, and that is, when you're coming home. I think it's very appropriate for all of us here who stayed during the break. It is a very important question, I believe, now, and also a very important question spiritually for all of us. I would like to start with a story which happened uh, some years ago. First time I was coming to the United States, I don't even remember how, it's probably about six, seven years ago. I'm from Serbia, and Serbian people and American people, they used to love each other. But then something happened, and we're not sure exactly what, but we do not like each other anymore. And, and, and that consequently meant that I would need a visa to the United States, and for all, for all of you who, need, who, have, who have visa to be here, you know how hard it is to get a visa. Well, I, I was invited by Pastor Jayford, uh, your chaplain here, and he said to me, he said to me, Dan, I will send you the letter, you apply for the visa, and, and that's what happened. I prayed about this, and a miracle did happen. I received visa to the United States. It was, uh, it was so beautiful. But the moment I received this visa, I was a little bit worried. I was a little bit worried for the very simple reason, and that is, is like I did not feel I, I you know, I, don't, I did not feel I belong here. You see, I'm in England for 11 years, and in England, uh, people uh, make sure you know you don't belong there. You know, the moment I arrived, uh, you know, they would use words like foreigner uh, or, 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 somebody <laughs> or, or some other words which have a similar connotation. I tried to fit really, really hard. 
You know, I was trying to speak English like English. Like you can see, I miserably failed. I have this, I have this, I have this beautiful Russian professional kill accent, which is staying with me forever. Unbelievable, isn't it? Some people this morning text, uh, on Thursday texted, I sound like a guru from Despicable Me. That's right. <laughs> That's correct. You know, you know, he went so far that my treasurer, he calls my wife Agent Lucy. You know, if you watch the last, you know, you know, a guru has a wife now. Well, she's Agent Lucy, so my wife is not called Agent Lucy. That's right, even though she sounds perfectly English. And then I remember, you know, I tried to fit so hard. And every single time I tried to fit in this place, I was reminded I don't belong there. Every single time I tried to do something to make sure I actually fit a little bit more, I was reminded I don't belong there. I try to do what English people do. I try to drink tea. <laughs> do you know how they drink tea? That's right, two fingers, look at this. You have and uh, the very strange thing about that beverage <laughs> is that they mix tea with milk. And if you think about this, if you put milk in hot water, that makes that milk go off, is that right? That's right. I was like, why would you do that? So I tried. And I tried. I drank about three or four of these. I gave up straight away. I was like, guys, you're strange. You need to stop doing that. The next thing I tried to do is like, OK, let me eat food that British, British eat. And so I went and started eating fish and chips. Uh, fish and chips is traditional British food. Includes potatoes and fish. That's it. You know, do, do you know what they do? They fry it. All I managed to do from this is to get fat. And I did not manage to fit in, in not even an inch more to become British. Every single time I was trying to fit in, I was reminded I don't belong there. And then the question to me, uh, you know, came to my mind, and that is, Dan, when are you coming home? When are you coming home? To re realize one day that when I went home, I did not belong there neither. Do you know what happens when you leave your country and go to another country, and one day you go back to your own country? You're not even there home for you are stranger in that land as well. To realize the very simple fact that that is wherever I go on this planet, I will be the stranger, I will be the foreigner. And then I remember this beautiful thing, and that is, you know what, maybe it's not so bad to be the foreigner. If you have that bad feeling in yourself, you know, maybe I'm the foreigner in this land, let me just encourage you and tell you it is not bad to be the foreigner. Do you know there are, there are this, there's a group of people called Kurds, and Kurds live in three, four different countries. They lost their own country. And one of the largest group of Kurds live in this place, in northern Iraq, and, and these people are there now for hundreds, a hundred, over hundred, hundreds of years. And these people live in the tents. Once somebody went to them and said, why, why you don't build houses from bricks or, or, or something like this? Why you don't build your home from the solid materials? And they looked at that person who I'm sure was somebody who coming from West or from Europe, and they looked him in the eyes and they said, the reason why we don't build houses from the bricks and the Malta and all other stuff is because we don't belong here. If you live in tents, to be reminded every single day that one day we will reach home. And we live in tents here to, 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 to make sure that this does not become my home. And then I realize, you know what? It's not so bad to be a foreigner. I wait for that day when Jesus comes, <laughs> because that's where my home is. I was coming to my America. I remember that coming to airport. As I came to airport, a policeman came to me and he asked me this question, where are you going? I said, I'm going to the United States of America. He looked at me and he said, where? I said, well, I'm going to Andrews University, explain these things. Uh, and he looked at me and I gave him this passport. Let me just show you. I, I, I think I brought it today. Yeah, I did this. This is my passport, this beautiful red passport. This passport, uh, if you would like to have one, you can buy it on eBay for about three, four dollars, by the way. Nobody wants it, man. No, nobody wants it. Uh, not even I want it, but hey, uh, that's what I have. It's like. You know, it's so hard to travel with this. Sometimes you need the visa to go to the toilet. They're like, uh, excuse me, can I go to the toilet? Visa, thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, sir, your visa expired. You cannot go to this toilet. You need to find some other toilet. That's right. Get lost. <laughs> I came there and gave my passport to this man. As this man looked at my passport, he saw this red thing and like, oh, what's this? Uh -huh. And you know, he can't even read his letters, you know. And, and, and we made it very difficult for them to read. And, and, and then he's like, what, what is this? It's like, it's passport. Like, you know, it's easy, pass, it's passport. Hey, 
And he was so, so scared about me that he, he, he asked me all these questions. And then he, he sticked a small sticker. I only got one this time. You see this little sticker on the back of your passport? When they stick this pa uh, little thing on your passport, this means a special security check. You see, but I didn't know that. I only had, you know, in those days it used to be just S. Now it says security, all right? In those was just S. I look him and I look at my pastor, it's like, who, who gave you permission to stick the sticker on my pastor, man? Uh, I didn't say that loud because I was very scared as well. Um, <laughs> he let me go with my luggage. I came to the check-in desk. As I gave my luggage in, this, the lady behind there, she started asking the same questions. She said, where are you going? I said, Andrews University. And all these things, blah, 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 blah. I gave all the same answers. When she finished, she took another sticker and she put it next to this. So I had, an, I had a two little stickers with two S's. I'm like, that sounds bad. S, S, T, I, had, I just want to know what's happening with this, but nobody's telling me. I was trying to go through the, the customs. As I was walking through customs, you know this. You know, you know when somebody clocks you, you know? And you, you're walking very nice, and you see somebody clocking you. And what do you do? This is what I do. He's like, I usually just walk here, and just see it just starts to change direction like this. As I was changing direction, this guy's like, hey, Hugh, come here. <laughs> Where are you going? I said, I just told two people where I'm going. It's like, what about you talk to each other? Yeah? So when you talk to each other, I don't need to tell you where I'm going three times. But he was not amused whatsoever. So he questioned me all the questions. Where I go, Andrews University, how long are you going to be there? This much. You, when are you coming back? Well, that's when I'm coming back. <laughs> and guess what she did? Well, she took another sticker <laughs> and put it on my passport. I had now SSS. I'm like, how long this is going to be? <laughs> Is it anybody going to tell me what this means? <laughs> They're all very quiet, very quiet. <sighs> I was thinking, you know what? I love stickers. <laughs> <laughs> it's not bad. When I leave this, I won't have a passport. I will just have a big S. <laughs> and I was walking. I, I went now through customs. I submitted my luggage. I went through customs. And as I was just walking, you know, there was about five meters to the free zone, to the, you know, duty, you know, duty free zone. As I was coming, another policeman, you know, pretty much jumped out out of furniture, kind of. <laughs> he, he, he was like, he was like. <laughs> and when you see something like this, you'll be worried. Like, what's wrong with you, man? <laughs> and he says, sir, I would like to ask you where you're going. <laughs> I said, I just spoke with three people before you. It's like, what about you text each other or something like this, man, because this is not fun anymore. <laughs> you see, you can talk to British police like this because they don't have guns. <laughs> you, know, you know that? <laughs> there, there is no guns. British police don't carry guns, by the way. <laughs> and so the worst thing that happened to you, he can, he can slap you, poo, or something like this. This is it, you know? But they can't even do that. They're weak. I don't know, maybe they're... He looks at me, he says, I need to check you. <laughs> I was like, I told everything to them and to them and to them. And he says, where are you going? Oh, I said, American University. He says, you need to come here, sit down here. I'm like, okay, I sit down. I sit down, he says, put your feet on the desk. I'm like, my mom told me not to put feet on the desk. <laughs> he looks at me, he says, man, you have to put his feet on the desk. So I put my feet on the desk, he checks my shoes, and he's like, oh, they're, they're, it's all right. I was like, of course it's all right. I paid 60 pounds for those shoes, he said. <clears throat> And he just let me go. Every single time I was stopped, I had a question in my mind. When are you coming home, there? And When are you coming home? You don't belong here. I went to that airplane and landed in the United States, Chicago airport. Like you know, United States uh, custom control, the best customer service in the world. <laughs> <laughs> they called me. And uh, they gave me to fill, you know, to fill the landing card. Happened some years ago when the questions were very funny questions, by the way. Now the card is much better. But the first question was my name and my surname, and I filled that thing. And this you know, the, the next question was pretty much this. The first question after my name, my age, and everything else was this. Are you a spy? You know, in the nice words. You know, are you working for some intelligence services or whatever it is? Pretty much the first question they asked me, are you a spy? <laughs> when you ask me a stupid question like this, you know, my mind goes crazy. <laughs> when I see question, I, I, I was, I was, uh, you know, I was feeling this, and I was thinking, I, I imagine this moment, you know, I'm coming with a car to the customer officer.
The next question that Kaara was thinking, it was a question, am I carrying domestic animals? <laughs> I, I, I look myself, I look my little bag, and I was thinking, do the Americans think I can fit a goat in my back? <laughs> the question three was, am I carrying snails? I was like thinking, is this what the Americans are afraid of? <laughs> a spy which is carrying a goat, and a goat has a small pad called snail, or something like this, I don't know. I remember this standing there, and I was thinking, I don't belong here when I'm coming home, when I, um, they aren't coming home. I came to the hotel, and this is the last part of this story I'm going to tell you. I came to the hotel, and I'd never been to a hotel before, believe me or not, and they gave me this plastic card. I thought <laughs> to myself, America people are such nice people. I just arrived in America, and they already gave me a credit card. But then the lady said, this, uh, uh, so, so this is your key. <laughs> I said, key? I said, I know how the key looks like, you know? It's uh, usually, uh, usually it's uh, this size <laughs> uh, in Serbia, and when you walk and you drop your key, you walk faster, <laughs> because it's, it's so much lighter to walk without it. And she said, no, so this is your key, and that night I went to, uh, actually came here, first time spoke just in the room behind them, and um, they returned me back, and uh, I took my key, plastic card, by the way, and I looked, and I couldn't find the room number. I thought to myself, this is going to be a very, very, very long night. <laughs> and so I went, you know, uh, to the floor I thought my room was. You know, I walked to the door, and I looked around. <laughs> you know, I'm sure you saw your mom and dad doing the same thing, you know. You know, <laughs> you're sitting in the living room, and your father walks in. And he's standing there pretending to be cool. But what he's doing, he's looking around, trying to remember what he came to that room. So, <laughs> so he, he is trying, he's looking around to see, is it anything going to trigger? So I was doing the same thing. I came out, I, I walked in, I realized that nothing is triggering. I said, I have to start. So I went to one of the doors, <clears throat> and put a key in the door. The light turned red, I pulled my key, I moved another door. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> put inside, it turned red, and I was doing that for a long time <laughs> <laughs> until somebody opened the door, and I was in this position. <laughs> I looked up, and he said, what are you doing? <laughs> I said, um, I can't remember what is my room number. <laughs> he said, you need to go to reception. I so went to reception, and, and I threw a key on that desk, and I said, why you didn't write me the room number on my key? And she looked at me and she said, sir, sir, that's for security of your room. I said, I'm sure my room is secured, because even I can't find it. <laughs> um, and she gave me my room number. I remember asking my same question, Dan, when are you coming home? When are you coming home? You don't belong here. You don't belong here. There is a story in the Bible of, uh, which you, I'm sure, would know quite well. He said the story that there was a father who had two sons. The youngest son came to his dad, and he said this. He said, Dad, I would like to receive my inheritance. And dad looked at him, and he said, what? <laughs> you want inheritance? He says, that's right. I'm not sure how it's in your country or, or how is it here, but in my country, if you want inheritance, you have to wait for somebody to die. Is that right? That's right. So he comes to his dad, he says, Dad, I would like my inheritance. In those days, the older brothers would receive two-thirds of inheritance, the younger brother only one. So father only had to fund one-third of the money. So what happened was very simple, you know. If I went to my dad when he was alive, and I said, Dad, can I get my inheritance? My dad would probably extend the right hand of fellowship, something like this. Boom. <laughs> you want my money? <laughs> Go, 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 boom. That's exactly. I'm sure it will happen in your culture as well. Because the very simple thing is this. You can't ask for inheritance if they're still alive. You cannot do this. But a young boy comes to his dad. Dad, give me the money. And dad looks at me. He says, you want money? No problem at all. The story starts very strange. But a father is an amazing father, I would say. He goes and he sells everything he has and gives one third of the money to the young boy. The young boy puts the money in the pocket and he walks away. As he walks away, he leaves his father and everybody else behind. If you do not know the end of the story, you do not know how father feels. You do not know if the father was angry or, or was, he, was, he, was he hoping. Or, but we know the end of the story. and We know the father was heartbroken and waiting for his son to come back home. Story goes very simple. He goes to land far away. He spends the money. 
as majority people would do. And then the hard time to the country comes. I don't think America experienced that time. That time, I don't think so. Maybe it may be some history, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know is it did Britain experience that? But I experienced a hard time in my country. And we, had a, we went through a few years of war. When I was age of 16, I survived, I think, three wars at that stage. Three wars. You don't know what to eat sometimes, and you live actually from Adra, or, or from people who help you. They send you, they send you packages, and you live from that. The point of this man is that he's trying to find a job, but he can't find a job. He's trying to find anything to do, and he can't find it. And then he finds a farm which has pigs, and on that farm, he gets the job. I have a friend who is Jewish. And my Jewish friend, I asked him one question. I said, my friend, if you had no other job except this job, would you do this job? He looked at me, and he said, Dan, you know what? We work hard, and we are not afraid to do anything, but I need to tell you that I would not do this job. And in this point of time, this man, this young boy, comes to point order, or what I call a point of total desperation. You know what? I hope you never get there. But sometimes you and me need that point in order for us to realize what's happening around us. You see, I'm a pastor's son. And for all my life, I believe that this story belonged to Jesus. All my life, when I read that story, I actually thought this is the original story of Jesus. I believe that he was the first person who actually used this story to find out a shocking thing, that this story never belonged to Jesus. This story belonged to Jewish narrative for hundreds of years before Jesus used this story. And the story was very similar, but very different. The story was a little bit different, actually. So now you can just imagine, Jesus is telling the story, you know, and he says, that the text explains that there was a lot of people listening. Moms, dads, children, teachers of the law, and many others. Teenagers, students, everybody was there. And now you can just imagine this story. Jesus is standing there, and he says, he says, Father had two sons. And the moment Jesus said this, Father had two sons, everybody knew the story. Because that story sounded in, in a time before Jesus like this. The original story sounded like this. Father had two sons. A younger boy came to him and said, Dad, I would like my inheritance. Dad looked him in his eyes. He said, no problem, my, my son. I will give you the inheritance. He goes, sells everything he has, gives him the money. The young boy, what he does, he packs his stuff and he walks away from that. As he walks away, he spends the money. And then... He's trying to find a job. He can't find a job. And one day he says this. He says this. You know what? This is it. My dad has plenty. I have nothing. I'm here and he's there. I'm going home. I'm going home. And the original story sounds this. He goes home. He knocks on the door. Dad opens the door. As he opens the door, he sees his father. As the father looks him. Son starts with his part of the story. He says, Dad, forgive me, for I have sinned against you and the heavens. Please take me back. And as he said that, this is what Dad did. He crossed his arms. He looked at me and he said, You wanted to be with the pigs? Go back to your pigs. When he came home, when he knocked on that door, and he said, Dad, please take me home. Father looked him in his eyes and he said, you wanted to be with the pigs? Please go back to your pigs. So you can just imagine, Jesus is standing there, people are listening, and Jesus says this, Father had two sons, and everybody in the crowd knows this story. Do you know why? Because moms and dads would use this story to teach their teenagers how not to behave. <laughs> you want my money? Here's the money. Get out. Finish. No coming back, my son. You want my money? Just please take all that belongs to you and never come back. So Jesus says, Father had two sons. The moment moms and dads in the crowd hear this, <laughs> do you know what they do? They wake up their boys and girls. They're like, hey, hey, dude, listen, <laughs> this is a good story. I love this story. You, <laughs> you <laughs> going to love this story as well. <laughs> you know? Teenagers, uh, teenagers, I work with teenagers. Uh, teenagers have this disease called, called hibernation. <laughs> they just hibernate all the time. So dad wakes them up. 
he says, let's listen to this story. And Jesus says, father, I have two sons. And, and, and what happened is he, he, the young boy comes to him and, and, and he takes inheritance. And dad is like, uh-huh. he took inheritance. Inheritance he took. Yes, yes. And then he says this, he says this, he says, he says, and then he went to the land far away, and he spent all his money. But one day he was working with the pigs, and he was sad, and he cried. And he's like, yeah, hey, listen, listen, pigs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Listen, don't, 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 don't close your eyes. Listen. And then Jesus goes, and he says, he says, then one day, one day the boy came to the point of total desperation, and he said this, he said this. He said, I'm going back to my father. And then he went home. And you can just imagine, it's building up. And then he knocked on the door. And dad opened the door. And as he opened the door, dad saw his son. And then he grabbed him and he kissed him. And he said, welcome home. Welcome home. You can just imagine moms and dads. <laughs> no, don't listen to this. <laughs> uh, Jesus... <laughs> You made a mistake. <laughs> when he comes home, he doesn't come back. Dad does this. Poof. That's right. What's that about, Jesus? And Jesus looks at me and he says, Yes, my brothers and my sisters, when he came home, and Dad grabbed him and kissed him, and he said, Welcome back, my son. It's good to have you back home. And Jesus, what he does is very simple. This is what he does in your and my life. He changes your story and my story for 180 degrees. You and me do not deserve to come home. But Jesus is saying this, oh yes, you deserve. Come home, come home, my son, my daughter. I want you home. My friends, the story really goes in the sense that the son, comes, son is coming home and dad is waiting for him. And then the text says, when he was far away, I was using, just trying to make this. It, as he was far away, dad saw him. And as he saw him, the text says that dad ran. In Jewish culture, uh, uh, people respect they don't run. Uh, for the very simple reason, girls would understand much better than boys. <laughs> uh, they had these long robes. If you have a long skirt, you can't run. Is that right? That's right. <laughs> because you can trip, you can step on a skirt, and all sorts of things can happen. <laughs> and a man, a man in Jewish culture is the same story. If you respected man, you wouldn't run because you had this long robe. And people, if, if they respected you, they would come to you to talk to you. You wouldn't go to Dan. And then you can just see this man on the hill. <laughs> you can see him. He picks up this robe, and he lifts him the robe, and then he starts running. You can just imagine how funny and not so funny was that. A man with hairy legs running there up the hill. <laughs> What's that? But he doesn't care. What he cares is that he, his son is coming home. And then the son is trying to tell his part of the story, but dad grabs him. And the Greek works explains that he was kissing him for a very long time. For any man, that's a little bit embarrassing. <laughs> you're like, and, and you're like, dad is now. But dad loves you. Dad loves you. And as he kisses him, son apologizes, and the father says this. He says, bring me the best robe for my son. That's what Jesus does in your life. Jesus comes to you, he looks at you, and he doesn't say this. He doesn't say, you smell on pigs. Can you please go have a shower? And then I will kiss you. He doesn't say, you know what? You don't look good to me right now. What about you change everything, come to me? Uh, Jesus calls in your life and my life, and he says this. Uh, bring me the best robe for my son. Bring me the best robe for my daughter. For I am not interested about your sins and your scars and your stains in life. What I'm interested in that you decide to come home, and because you decide to come home, I will cover all the sins, all the stains, all the wounds in your life with the best thing, and that's my role, my son, my daughter. Jesus looks again, and he says, listen, bring him, the, bring him the ring, because in those days, you would have only rings how many sons you have. If you, if you have a son, you would have a, you know, you just have three rings if you have three sons. So he doesn't have a ring, and I don't think father had a spare ring. <laughs> I have a feeling that he just took, a, you know, the, 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 the ring from his hand and put on the son's hand. He said, whatever belongs to me belongs to you, my son. And then he says, bring the shoes for my son, because shoes in those days meant very, very important things. And that is that he is the son, he is not the servant. For there is a spiritual Negro song which says, all God's children will have shoes in heaven. Because in those days, 
And even sometimes today, there are people who are still in slavery, and they have nothing on their feet, and their masters wear the shoes. And what Jesus says in your life and my life, you are not the slave, you are my daughter, you are my son, and that whatever is mine is yours. And let me tell you, I am the king of universe, which makes you nothing less the rulers of this universe with me. And then comes the best part, at least for me. Father says, let's kill cow, and let's make barbecue. <laughs> it's the best part for me, it's not the best part for the cow. But, uh, and they eat and they celebrate. And do you know what the father says to his son? He says this, my son, I will treat you as you never left. I will treat you, my son, as you never left. When I was a boy, 13, about, about, about a teenager, I remember the day I ran away from home. I was a younger brother, seven years older. Brother was hibernating, he was a teenager. And uh, what I would do is I would take a pillow, <laughs> I would make a shield out of a pillow, you know, like a small Roman soldier. I would like make step by step and I would kind of, you know how, you know how older brothers, they all sleep all the time and older sisters, and you want to play with them and they don't want to play with you? <laughs> That was the situation. I was a little boy. He was about starting for I think. And I, I, I would poke him. <laughs> uh, poke? Uh, poke? Uh, and then <laughs> in that moment, my brother would be sleeping like this. <laughs> they, 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 have, they make sounds like a bear, by the way. <laughs> and and I, I would poke him. Poke? Poke? And, and in one moment, he, he tried to hit me with a, with a hand, you know. <laughs> but I, I, I had a shield. <laughs> so what would happen? He would hit the pillar, and I'd go, <laughs> And what I would do is like, I would just forward. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I kind of like a poke, a poke, poke. And he would, he would hit me, poof, yeah. and then usually I'll fly further and further, you know. <laughs> and I was like, okay, okay, we can do it, we can do it. And, and one moment my brother would just stand up. You can just imagine, seven years old than me. And you'd be me with a shield. That's not good. Wait a minute. What to do now? It's too late. My brother would just grab me, you know, for my T-shirt and for my shorts, like this. <laughs> and he would come to the door, and he would just do this. <laughs> I was the long flying boy without any equipment, by the way, for very many years. <laughs> I <was> like, <laughs> in that moment, I realized I had to run because my life was in danger. <laughs> I went to my mom. I went to my dad, actually, because my dad was a pastor. And there was a desk, and there was a chair, you know. And as I came to the, the it was empty. My dad was visiting that day. I'm like, not a good day, not a good day. You, usually, I would just stand next to my dad's chair like this. And my brother would be there behind the corner, and he would be sending me messages of love. Some, some, something, like, something like this. Come, come. <laughs> and, and I'll be like, no, man, no. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he would say, he said, hey, hey, Carl. <laughs> and I'm like, ah. Oh. And I'll be, I'll, I was like, yeah, look at daddy, huh? <laughs> and and he, 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 he would like, he like, huh? <laughs> and I'm like, what does that mean, man? <laughs> but that day, dad wasn't there. I ran away to my mom the next second. But you see, moms are ninjas. Especially Serbian moms, man. You can't mess around with them. My mom's kitchen was under our room. And so she listened. And she listened, small steps, big steps, small steps, big steps. And, and she created this image of what happened. So I came to my mom. Mom, my older brother is trying to destroy me. <laughs> and, and mom looks at me. <laughs> she says, maybe you deserve. <laughs> I'm like, is it, is it? Uh, you're supposed to be my mother <laughs> and save me. And I realized that day, if I don't leave, my life will be in danger. <laughs> so I ran outside. I went all the way back to the backyard, and I climbed on the shed. And my brother came to me, and he said, come down. I looked at him. I said, let me think about this. No. <laughs> <laughs> Which upset him even more. He said, come down. You'll be hungry. You'll have to come down. And I looked at him, and no. <laughs> because if you don't see Mr. Genius, next to me, there is apple tree. <laughs> so I picked up the apple. I took a big bite. And I like, you see? It's really sweet. And my brother's like, I'm coming up. I was like, no, you're not. Because if you try to climb, I'm going to hit you with this apple so hard <laughs> that you will never want to eat apple pie in your life again. And he knew I can do that. Then he looked at me and he said, he said, calm down. 
you have to go to the toilet. I said, I can do it here. <laughs> do you want me to demonstrate? <laughs> and my father's like, no, 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 try, man. try. And he left. You know, I thought I can be there forever. I had apple tree, I had everything I needed, man. You know, and it was a hot Serbian summer. Hot Serbian summer is about 35 Celsius. This summer was 42 Celsius. I don't know what it is in Fahrenheit. That's like, that's like not good, all right? <laughs> that's like global warming, totally not good, all right? And I'm there eating these apples. Man, I'm sick and tired of apples. I'm like, I would trade my apples all three for a little piece of bread. You know, I'm sitting there, I'm like, oh, man. When is dad going to come home? And dad was visiting. My dad used to visit like 15 people a day, man. You know what I mean? He goes in the morning, he comes back late night. And he was used to go on bicycle. I'm like, he should have went with the car this time, but now look at him. And, and you know what? I was there all day, man. It was so hot. I started seeing pink elephants. <laughs> What's happening here, man? In one moment, it was about 6 or 7 o'clock evening. I hear the bicycle. My dad used to go with bicycle. He wanted to be fit pastor. He didn't want to be, yeah. And I, I heard him. I quickly came down from the shed. I ran to my dad, and I said, dad, I said good evening, Dad. He said, good evening, my son. He like, gave me a little pat, and, and, and I walked with him in the house. And, and I, you know, and I thought I won. I thought I won. So I went to my bed, and I slept that night very nicely. And, <laughs> and tomorrow morning when I woke up, um, my dad was sitting on my bed. <laughs> he said, good morning, my son. I said, good morning, Dad. He said, um, you look a little bit burned in your face. I said, that's because um, I was trying to catch some tan yesterday. <laughs> I tried. Not good. My dad looked at me. He said, I know the story, my son. He said, I know what you've done, and I don't know what you've done is not right. But he said, I did not come here today to tell you off. I came here today to tell you about what happened about 5 o'clock that evening. I said, but dad, what happened? And he said to me, your mom and your brother, they set the table for the dinner. And they sat around the table and they waited for you, thinking that you will come back so you can, you can have that dinner with them. But then he asked me the question and he said, Dad, he asked me, he said, son, do you know why they did that? And I looked him back and I said, no, no, I don't know that. And he said this because they wanted to show you that they will treat you as you never left. Uh, my friend, my brother, my sister, Andrews University is a journey towards your educational excellence, but Andrews University is a journey back home, back home to Jesus Christ. And you know what? If you decide to go on that journey, I want you to be with you because I know that we together can make it. It's not always easy. It's not always that easy to go through all these things. But when I fall, you pick me up, and when you fall, I pick you up. So what I want to ask you tonight, my friend, is when are you coming home? When are you coming to Jesus Christ? If you haven't made a decision in your life, tonight is time to make the decision. Wherever you are, how far you are from him, how long you left him, he is calling you tonight. And he says, son, daughter, come home. It is time to come home. Would you make the decision today with me? For I want to make the decision with you. I want us all together. To that make journey towards our Father, Jesus Christ, and so we can all together be in that eternity, in a place where everything is perfect, a place with no tears, no more goodbyes, and no more death, all together. Would you want to make the decision with me? For I make the decision today, once again, to come home. If you would like to make a decision, put a hand in there. And, uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for God wants you home as he wants me. God bless you all. Let us bow our heads and pray. Dear Jesus, we are here at Andrews University. We are trying to make our journey towards many, many things in our life. We want to make sure that we, we finish our education and we may want to make sure maybe to meet some good people in our life here. But dear God, at this stage in our life, we also make decision in this time tonight to come home. Uh, we know we don't belong here. For we have home there with you, where we are not the foreigners, but truly the, 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 the people, the, lead, the, the, the priesthood which you called us to be. Dear God, this night, I pray that you pour Holy Spirit in all of us here, and on all campus, for all those who are here and who are not here. And we pray, dear God, that tonight you can seal this decision in our hearts so we never give up. 
so we never give up on the journey from you. And dear Jesus, thank you so much for everything, but thank you so much for dying on the cross for me and everybody else here, for the good news that you're coming soon, so we are praying that you do. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all.